Today, I'm honored to discuss the enduring legacy of Rachel Carson, a pioneering environmentalist whose work sparked a global environmental movement. Her groundbreaking book, Silent Spring, published in 1962, played a pivotal role in raising public awareness about environmental issues and the impact of human activities on the natural world. Rachel Carson's meticulous research and eloquent writing in Silent Spring exposed the dangers of indiscriminate pesticide use, particularly DDT, and its devastating effects on wildlife and ecosystems. Her work challenged the practices of agricultural scientists and the government, prompting a nationwide debate on environmental policy and public health. Carson's advocacy led to a shift in national pesticide policy and laid the foundation for the modern environmental movement. Her efforts contributed to the creation of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the eventual ban of DDT in the United States. Her legacy extends beyond environmental policy. She inspired generations to appreciate the interconnectedness of all living things and the importance of conserving the natural world. Rachel Carson's work reminds us of the power of informed, passionate advocacy in affecting change. In conclusion, Rachel Carson's life and work continue to be a beacon of inspiration, emphasizing the importance of environmental stewardship and the responsibility we bear towards our planet. Photography, since its inception, has not just been about creating images. It's a powerful tool that chronicles our world and experiences. The journey of photography began in the early 19th century with the daguerreotype, a process that created a single, unique image. This invention revolutionized the way we document life, making it possible to preserve moments in time forever. Since then, Photography has undergone tremendous changes, from the introduction of color and digital photography to today's advanced smartphone cameras. Photography has played a crucial role in historical documentation, giving us visual insights into past events and cultures. Iconic photographs have the power to evoke emotions, provoke thought, and sometimes even spur social change. They serve as windows into times and places that words alone cannot fully capture. Moreover, the digital era has democratized photography, making it more accessible and allowing people from all over the world to share their perspectives and stories. The rise of social media has further amplified this, transforming how we communicate and view the world. In conclusion, the evolution of photography reflects the evolution of human expression and connection. It reminds us of the power of a single image to capture the complexities of life and history.
There is a picture, sort of artist's impression, before the space age of what Venus might be like on its surface and so this was looking at the planet Venus. It was science fiction and science fact all the way up to 56 before the start of the space age but it wasn't completely disproved. This idea of a really sort of lush environment on Venus until 1967, which is when the first measurements in detail were done at Venus. So Mariner 4 and Mariner 5 confirmed the feeling from an earlier space mission that in fact the surface of Venus was not like this at all, but extremely hot and, and also that the clouds were made of sulfuric acid so there wasn't a nice water cycle like is going on in this picture and so, that it had to wait for these in situ measurements by spacecraft to actually do that and so Venus turned out not to be quite as Earth-like as we thought and I'll sort of tell you about some of the latest results from Venus Express, which, which they actually there are some Earth-like features, but to a large extent, it's not like the Earth. Carbon dioxide, or Colorado II, is the main greenhouse gas in climate change. So how does CO2 get into our atmosphere? Well, carbon is part of a cycle. It starts with the sun, which heats the Earth's surface with more energy in one hour than the whole world uses in a year. Plants, which are kind of like biological chefs, take that sunlight, and then suck in some CO2 from the air, mix them together, and bam! They create a stored form of energy, in the form of carbohydrates such as glucose and sucrose. The process is called photosynthesis. When animals like us eat those plants our stomachs convert that food back into energy for our own growth. Greenhouse gases are a byproduct of this process, and are released through waste. If those plants die, they decompose, and tiny microorganisms break down those carbohydrates and again, release greenhouse gases as a byproduct. As you see, energy originates from the sun. It is then transferred as it moves through the food chain. But sometimes, carbon-based organisms like plants or animals get stuck in the earth. When this happens, they're compressed under tons of pressure, and turned into carbon-based fossil fuels like oil, coal or natural gas. Last week we talked about how people recognize objects, and really how well people recognize objects, given how difficult the problem is, given how objects can be seen in all different sorts of illumination, in different positions, in different angles, 
And yet we are able to extract that information. We are able to take the visual stuff out there, interpret it in a way that allows us to recognize all the different things that we can see in our environment. Today, we're going to kind of carry on looking at that. We're going to look at what's really a special class of objects. That's the human face. We're going to look at how we recognize human faces and how we do, do it quite as well as we do. We're really expert at recognizing faces. So again, we can think about how do we take that visual information and how do we transfer it into a form which allows us to put a name to a face and to do all the other clever things we can do with faces. So I'm going to start off again by just pointing out that it's a hard problem. Face recognition is a hard problem, and it's a clever thing we do. If you think about all the different types of faces you can recognize and all the different types of information you can get from the face, you kind of start to appreciate how well we can do face recognition. Yeah, yeah, yeah.